One of the interesting observations about HDL, if you read the literature, even from what um, my, you know, the people are often referred to as lipophobes, they'll now say that HDL is a good biomarker of carbohydrate intake. So when they do studies, and Frank Sachs and his colleagues did this at, uh, when they published a study in Harvard uh, last year in the New England Journal of Medicine that was attributed to showing that it doesn't matter what the nutrient composition is, only calories, they said by looking at HDL, we could tell how much carbohydrates were people eating. The less carbohydrates, the higher the HDL. And what's interesting, if you go back to Framingham in the 70s, HDL was always the single best predictor of risk of heart disease. I mean, for women, it's virtually the only thing that matters. It's so much better than LDL or total cholesterol triglycerides. And if HDL is a biomarker for, for carbohydrate consumption, then those studies in the 70s and the 60s that showed HDL was the single best predictor of risk were saying that people who ate the least carbohydrates had the least heart disease and the greatest, um, the least mortality. So now go to the next slide. Calories or carbohydrates. This is the point I want to make. Um, people go on low-fat diets. This came out of like uh, the A to Z study at Stanford, where they compared a low-fat calorie. One of the two of the diets were low-fat calorie restricted versus an Atkins-like diet. And then they say, well, some people lose weight on either diet, so maybe some people do better on low-fat, and other people do better on low-carb. And the point I want to make is a low-fat diet that's calorie restricted is also a low carbohydrate diet. And you could see in this study in the shy on the left, this is slide 63 under low fat diet, the total energy after 24 months is reduced by about you know, 570 calories. But then if you look below to the change from baseline of carbohydrates, these people are eating 330 less carbohydrate calories per day and 170 less fat calories down at the bottom. Um, so even a low-fat diet, the primary thing that's restricted is carbohydrates, and that's because most of us, the greatest proportion of calories in the diet come from carbohydrates. So just by mathematics, if you tell someone to eat a 1,500 and 1,800 calorie a day diet, they are going to restrict carbohydrates most, even on a low-fat diet. And what you want to know is, is the effect seen is the weight loss seen in these studies because they're eating less total calories, less fat, less protein, and less carbohydrates, or is it because they're eating less carbohydrates specifically? Because as far as I'm concerned, carbohydrates are regulating fat accumulation. And the other thing that happens when people go on these diets, and this would be true for the Mediterranean diet as well, is they increase the quality of the carbs they do eat. And by that I mean they lower the fructose content primarily, and they lower the glycemic load, the glycemic index. So you put someone on a, a, even a low-fat diet or Mediterranean diet, among the changes they'll make is they'll get rid of potatoes for the most part. They'll get rid of the more obvious sources, you know, white bread, and um, you're going to tell them eat more whole grains, eat more green vegetables. So there'll be some change in glycemic index, some improvement. But they'll make changes like they'll get rid of beer and drink light beer, or give up beer entirely. They'll get rid of sodas and drink diet sodas or switch to water. They may even get rid of juices and switch to water, and they'll perceive it as a way to get rid of calories. But the calories they're getting rid of are fundamentally carbohydrates. They're half fructose, so the most fattening of the calories. And liquid calories are probably more fattening as well because we digest them quicker. They get into the bloodstream. You'll get more of an end. You know, they have a higher glycemic index. They'll also get rid of desserts because desserts have a high fat content. So they may see that they're not eating cake or ice cream or something after dinner. But in doing it, what they perceive as getting rid of fat is also getting rid of sweets, fructose. So both the quantity of the diet changes, the quantity of carbs decreases, and the quality of carbs improves on any diet. And the question you want to know, and again, what I would argue is any diet, if the person loses weight, it's not because they do better on low fat or low carb. It's because they've gotten rid of the fattening carbohydrates. And it's one of the messages I would like to get across in the next book, and I'd like to get the medical community to understand, so that when they do these studies, they realize that even a low-fat, calorie-restricted diet reduces the carbohydrates 
and improves the carbohydrates, and that's probably why those patients often lose weight, too. Anyway, any questions? Who's still with us? I'm with you. I'm with you. Gary, you mentioned, like, uh, tell me if my perceptions are correct, but, like, um, it seems like the central thesis is uh, refined and easily digestible carbohydrates is what seems to be driving a lot of the fat accumulation. And then I heard you on some other talks discuss, um, you know, it may all be the, the sugar or the fructose. Well, it's conceivable that you need fructose, the effect of fructose in the liver to sort of set off the insulin resistance and this vicious cycle of insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. Um, I can easily believe that. Um, if you look at the epidemiologic data, one of the answers I often get back is, um, uh, you know, what about the Asians? What about the East, you know, Japanese? And they eat high-carb diets, and they're, they weren't fat. They're getting fatter in the Chinese. And, um, and the, the point is they ate extremely low-sugar diets. So maybe you need a certain amount of sugar in the diet to trigger insulin resistance. Um, and there's already studies that have been done. Jerry Shulman at Yale has shown that the effect of fructose in the liver, um, you know, one of the things it does, it's, it's, it could be the cause, fundamental cause of insulin resistance. But the question is, once somebody is insulin resistant or hyperinsulinemic, is it enough to just remove the sugar? You know, can you just tell your patient, and I, I don't believe it is. I mean, I think the world is full of obese diabetics and even lean diabetics who long ago realized they shouldn't be eating sweets and drinking Coke and apple juice, and it, that doesn't make any difference. And then the only way you could have an effect, if you can do it, is to get rid of all the carbohydrates. And, and sometimes not even, um, you know, not even the refined carbs would be, uh, you know, the, the flour and the starch, you might have to get rid of most of the vegetables as well and just um, if you want to get you know make these people lean again and get them off their drugs so I do think it's conceivable that sugar is sort of the necessary ingredient to start this vicious cycle off but once it's started I don't believe it's enough to just remove the sugar and that's also based on anecdotal data I know that you know with me it wouldn't be enough but, but I mean also like if Dr. Uh, William Davis was talking at the beginning of the series about when he gets people to just get rid of the grains, you know, the amylopectin, right. or high glycemic, you know, it just seems like I still think that it's the refined carbohydrates. I mean, it seems like the sugar might be the main part, but maybe it's the glycemic index of the, the carbohydrate that's in grains, too, do you think? Well, I think it's both. I mean, I think it's both, but I don't know, like I said, if let's imagine we never had, you know, we never ate, we, we, we lived in a low-sugar consuming con country and our mothers lived in a low sugar consuming country and their mothers did so there weren't these intrauterine effects that happen um would what would the grains do to us that's the question um and they could stimulate obesity in some people and they could stimulate metabolic syndrome i don't know i'm just saying um you know i assume with dr davis that when they get rid of the grains, they also get rid of it. I can't imagine that he keeps them eating high, you know, even close to the level of sugars that they, you know, a normal American would eat. Right, absolutely. I could be wrong, but I just, like I said, oh. I make the assumption that virtually everyone who goes on any kind of diet or even embarks on an exercise program to lose weight will get rid of the most offensive calories in the diet, which is the sugar and the high fructose corn syrup you know, whether they know they're doing it or not. Um, so, you know, to me it's it's probably both. Like you could start your patients off by getting rid of one or the other and see if it, ha- it works. Nice. But um, if it doesn't, will they come back? And the other thing that I worry about is the addiction to carbs, um, the craving for them. And as long as they're hyperinsulinemic, it seems, you know, basically one of the things insulin does, it tells the mitochondria not to burn carbs, uh, not to burn fat, but to burn carbs. Mm-hmm. So, um, in effect, as long as you're hyperinsulinemic, carbohydrates are the only fuel your body wants to use. So, to me, that's enough to explain the cravings. Um, it's also enough to explain the binge behavior. <laughs> <laughs>